Our third panel of the conference, and our last panel today, uh, is entitled Protecting Civil Liberties in the Cyber Age. Uh, and again, another very important topic that uh, uh, Charlie and I were trying to put this conference together. We thought this is an issue that really needs to be aired in this particular conference. So the moderator is the Associate Director of the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. Charlie Dunlap. Charlie, over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we had a terrific uh, first session, and I think you're going to be very pleased with, uh, with the folks that we have for this panel. You know, uh, this panel is related to what we were talking about this morning, and it's talking about protecting civil liberties in the cyber era. And there's a lot of dimensions to this. One of the things that I found transitioning from being in the military to being a civilian. In the military, you have no expectation that you're going to have any privacy. You know they're reading your emails. You're being polygraphed. You're being investigated. You're being blood tested, everything. But what's remarkable uh, when you get into academia and have the opportunity to, uh, to refresh yourself with cases, it really is remarkable in the area, especially <coughs> Uh, electronically, information that's in an electronic format, what, what the law is. And I think Patrick's going to give us some help on this in, in his uh, presentation. But when you look at cases like Smith v. Maryland and um, in the, the Knotts case and the degree to which uh, information in electronic format is available and there isn't an expectation of privacy and so forth, it, it's remarkable when you look at that. We've seen some recent cases, though, that seem to be uh, going the other way. The Warshak case out of the Sixth Circuit, for the first time that I'm aware of, found an expectation of privacy in emails. One of the things that you, many of you are aware of, but perhaps many of you aren't, most of the time when you sign up for an email account, you have agreed to let third parties read the content of your emails. And that's one of the rationales that there is no expectation of privacy in emails, even though you may think you're sending them just to another specific person. And in addition, uh, there's been a recent case, uh, Maynard case in the DC circuit, which talks about uh, limiting the government's authority to put a GPS <coughs> tracker on your vehicle. You know, there are cases that are out there that gives the, the government a lot of authority to surreptitiously, without a warrant, put a GPS device on your vehicle. So those cases are out there. But I think overall, the law is not particularly, at this moment, very protective of civil liberties. There's a whole other aspect of this in terms of the data that's out there, and I think uh, Suzanne captured it very interesting. In the future, is anybody going to have any privacy? Because apart from what the government may be doing, we have what commercial, uh, commercial enterprises are doing. There's an awful lot of information out there. The way that they can capture it, the way they can use it, the way they can mine it is something that has, at the end of the day, the effect of eroding what many people might consider their, their personal privacy. And in fact, in fact, there's some legislation pending that may or may not uh, speak to that in a way that is more protective of uh, personal privacy. And the third thing that I'd just like to throw out there so that we can discuss it, and this is a little bit of my own uh, little hobby horse, we recently had uh, a memorandum of agreement between the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. And it's designed, and Patrick can correct me on this, but I believe it's designed <coughs> to bring to bear on the issue of protecting the cyber uh, infrastructure, the civilian domestic cyber in infrastructure, the capabilities of the National Security Agency. And there's various things in this relationship that are intended to ensure that uh, personal privacy and civil liberties are protected. But one of the things uh, that people of a certain age may recall is that there's a little bit of an unhappy history of involving domestic, uh, involving military intelligence agencies in domestic activities. We might remember the Church Commission in 1976, which a lot of the students really aren't aware of because they didn't live through that era. 
That was a period in which time in which there were 1,500 military intelligence agents that were attending rallies, political developments, and so forth. And 100,000 Americans were, had records established on them by military intelligence agencies. Since that time, we've had a whole series of laws and executive orders that have been put in place to prevent a repetition of that. But then again, we recently had the case, um, and I'm going to get this Arabic wrong, so please don't hesitate to correct me if you can. The Al Harmani, Al Harman Islamic Foundation versus Obama case, which arose out of the terrorist surveillance program, and the allegation there was that NSA unlawfully uh, wiretapped the attorneys representing the foundation, and in December. They, uh, they won a $2.5 million judgment. But interestingly enough, the Obama administration, even though the TSP program itself was abandoned, I believe during the Bush administration actually, uh, has appealed this judgment and they're, they're fighting the case, which I find, find kind of interesting. And one of the things that Joel said this morning I think really resonated, and perhaps those of you who, who also uh, teach it may resonate as well. He made a, a remark along the lines that there's a little bit of a generational difference between how people look at privacy and civil liberties uh, between the younger generation that's grown up in a totally, uh, in an environment where so much of their personal lives is out there on the web and they put it out there on the web and those of another, perhaps another generation who are, are perhaps more concerned about that, or at least so it seems, and maybe that can be part of the discussion. Um, when I was talking with my colleague over lunch, I think it, it may be one of the things that we have at play here is that perhaps we have not talked enough about what is the value of privacy, what are the value of civil li liberties in this particular arena. And I would suggest, and maybe the panelists have some comments on it, that it may have something to do, the real value of it is when you look back and why the Founding Fathers wanted it. The Founding Fathers wanted it because they, they needed to have the opportunity to exchange with other like-minded people some half-baked and half-formed ideas. Without those ideas and, and half-baked conversations be exposed to governmental scrutiny and, and public scrutiny. And we, perhaps it's something to think about what is the future going to be like when, if, as Suzanne says, everything, there is no privacy in the future, and she may well be right, where everything is subject to public scrutiny. Will that change the way people think? And will that serve to inhibit creativity? Will that serve to change the country, kind of country that we have? Because you won't have that opportunity to test your ideas in a, in a safe audience before they're known to the world. So that is perhaps one of the, the interests in privacy, especially as we look at the cyber age where the law seems to consider cyber matters very much public in a way that documents, letters, and so forth are not. With that, uh, why don't I introduce our, our first uh, Panelists, uh, Mr. Patrick Reynolds, he's the Deputy General Counsel for Operations at the National S Security Agency. He is a, uh, he has a, his bachelor's and law degree is from Georgetown University, but interestingly enough, and I really like this, his bachelor, as a Jesuit educated person myself, his bachelor's degree is in philosophy, and his JD cum laude is also from the Georgetown Law Center. He actually knows the client's business. He was an intelligence analyst himself. Uh, he also served in private industry in a law firm. He returned in 19, 1997 to NSA and had, had various positions. He was the Office of General Counsel's Attorney of the Year in 2001. He was, uh, and in 2003, the director of NSA appointed him to the Defense Intelligence Senior Executive Service. That means he's a general in the NSA world. Um, in 2007, the president conferred upon Mr. Re Reynolds the rank of meritorious executive. And uh, he certainly were, 
We're, we were a little uncertain earlier with the government shutdown whether he's going to be with us today, but fortunately, things did work out, and here he is. Thank you, Charlie. I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, as Charlie says, I'm from the National Security Agency, and uh, we don't get out much, so I'm happy, I'm happy to be invited. Um, you don't need to. <laughs> and I've met a couple of colleagues from, uh, from NSA uh, of former days and see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, I, uh, those, when I first went to NSA, the joke was that the individuals stood for no such agency or never say anything. And the newspapers and some lawsuits have done much to bring out into the open uh, an agency that was not out in the open. But to the extent that those didn't do it, the Simpsons movie did. So one of my favorite uh, scenes from a movie, which I brought with me, but it's probably not worth showing you, is if you've seen the Simpsons movie, um, the, the Simpsons are on the run, and they cut to NSA, an actual rendering of the NSA building. Deep inside an operations center, it's vast and endless. You, can, you can't see the end. There's people everywhere, all wearing headphones. And as the camera pans across these cartoon people, you can hear each conversation in there about ordering pizzas and boyfriends and girlfriends and all kinds of nonsensical things. And so they get to one, the guy jumps up and tears up his headphones because he's heard of Lisa Simpson and he says, we did it! The government actually found someone we're looking for! So I, so I love that scene. I didn't know it was going to be in the movie when I had to see it. I took my 13-year-old son to see it. Um, and I love it for two reasons. One, it points out the absurdity, um, I hope, of the government monitoring every communication that there is. It can't be done. And more to the point, even if it could be done, we wouldn't want to do it. Secondly, it points out, I think, one of the quintessential civil liberties, which is the freedom to make fun of your government. And that's what I told my son afterward. It's a very funny scene. I enjoy it. I've kept a clip of it. But the, the, the deeper point to me is that, that one, of the, one of the fundamental freedoms we have is to challenge and even ridicule our government. So with that, I will um, attempt to address the topic of civil liberties in a cyber age. Um, what I'd like to do is walk through the intelligence collection side of NSA's mission. We, in essence, we do collect communications of um, foreign intelligence interests. So a couple things I think we have to take as axiomatic we're going to discuss civil liberties. One is, what civil liberty are we talking about? And essentially, I think it's the Fourth Amendment freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. So I'll talk a little about the history of the application of that amendment to electronic surveillance, or the development of the electronic surveillance law with respect to the amendment, the way you want to look at it. Then talk about the um, passage of the FISA in 1978, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And finally, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act amendments of 2000. And I'll do that on a relatively brief time, so don't worry. But I do think that the subject necessitates a look back a little bit um, if, we are to, if we are to make sense of it. A couple other things we have to take for granted, I think. It is necessary for the national security to have a mission like NSA has. And by, by axiomatic, I mean if you don't agree with that, my conversation is not going to persuade you of that. I think it's a fundamental axiom of the discussion that in some form, in some way, it's necessary to collect foreign intelligence by, in essence, eavesdropping on communications. Um, another axiom that I have to accept, I think, is that people tend to distrust large, powerful, secret organizations. And I work for one of those. So I need to be uh, mindful of the fact that, though I know exactly what we're doing, you don't. And that may raise concerns for you. So the question at issue, I think, is how do we vindicate the civil liberties that all of us enjoy by proxy? It's impractical for each one of you to watch exactly what we're doing. So by proxy, through representation, through other branches of the government, you have a voice in both the rules and the oversight of the rules. Um, so again, I'd like to approach historically, then up to the FISA, and then the FISA Amendments Act. What I hope to do is dispel the notion, to the extent it exists, that the FISA Amendments Act is unconstitutional on its face. We have, we have a lawsuit right now um, that we are dealing with that was filed on the day the act passed, alleging it's unconstitutional on its face. Um, for reasons we will talk about, I don't think that's the case. And in fact, my thesis really further is that greater protection is afforded to US citizens in terms of their civil liberties since the passage of the FAA than was the case before. And I'll talk about why. And I'll do all that in eight or nine minutes. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to go back to 1967. 
famous case called Katz versus United States. Really, that's where the phrase reasonable expectation of privacy comes from. Katz jettisoned 40 years worth of case law, which had said, if there's no physical intrusion, then you don't have a Fourth Amendment issue at all. So there were wiretapping cases way back to 1928, um, Olmstead. Supreme Court almost universally dismissed those cases by saying, you haven't raised a Fourth Amendment claim. All that changed in 1967 with Katz. That language we all use now, reasonable expectation of privacy, comes from the Katz case. Um, so the court said that electronic surveillance is a search and seizure. The court also said that it couldn't imagine a case in which law enforcement would need to engage in electronic surveillance without a warrant. Um, it carefully circumscribed the, the, its opinion so as not to touch what it called national security cases. So on the one hand, it set out a rule for law enforcement. On the other hand, it left national security cases alone. It was 1967, NSA was formed in 1952, and we were doing what we were doing. Um, I wasn't there at the time, but my sense is we paid little if any attention to the Katz case at the time, except to acknowledge what we're doing is a search and seizure. We better do it reasonably. No one's really told us how to do it reasonably. Um, 1968, Congress followed up the Katz case by passing a statute that, in essence, told law enforcement steps that they could take in order to engage in electronic surveillance, um, how it secured a warrant under the Constitution. Again, that statute was careful to say, not talking about national security cases, you leave the president's authority undisturbed, whatever that authority is. 1972, the Keith case further circumscribed what that national security definition was without going into too much detail. Um, in essence, it, it made clear that a warrant under the Fourth Amendment was required for what it called domestic security cases. So not involving foreign entities, but a purely domestic threat to the government. Um, so by 1972, you had case law starting in 1928, but by 1972, making clear that law enforcement operated under potentially at least a different set of rules than foreign intelligence agencies. Those rules required a Fourth Amendment warrant for law enforcement to do electronic surveillance. It was unclear, at best, what was required for foreign intelligence. In the early 70s, um, there were several circuit court cases, one level below the Supreme Court, finding that, in fact, the president possessed the authority under the Constitution to engage in electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes without a warrant. Okay? That's something that gets lost in the discussion because we have had a FISA in place since 1978. But, but the courts, not the Supreme Court, which never has addressed the issue, but the circuit courts, um, all but one, which I'll talk about, plainly stated the president had authority without a warrant. So again, the Fourth Amendment is structured in a way that requires reasonableness, but the question of whether warrants required is not so clear. And sometimes the courts say yes, and sometimes no. Um, the DC Circuit did in dicta, in language that wasn't necessary for the case, suggests otherwise. It suggests that in fact, the president needed a warrant, the executive branch needed a warrant to engage in electronic surveillance, even for foreign intelligence purposes. So all that's floating out in the air by the 70s, when uh, I think Mr. Pincus has left, but he talked about the investigation of Watergate. Um, Charlie talked some about the Church Commission. Those congressional, congressionally formed committees started to take shape, started to investigate, among other things, the intelligence community and its activities, and found things wanting, to say the least. Um, so a couple of things I'll mention. There were many, many things addressed. The Church Commission report is a public report. Uh, there are people in the audience, such as Homer, who probably know it much better than I do. But um, in essence, with respect to NSA in particular, two findings that I'll talk about only briefly. One was among, so we were doing really two things. One was true foreign communications collection, what we used to call uh, mix to pinks, right? You know, totally outside the US, get a circuit from two foreign cities and gather the foreign intelligence there. We were also doing things, some things domestically, that Charlie alluded to. One was a watch listing of US citizens. So we would, um, our organization would, place on a watch list the name of a US person, justifying that by saying that they were being controlled by a foreign power. And so this is really foreign intelligence surveillance. There were no rules for the intelligence community at this time. So what we did was fire on groups. The other thing we did um, that's, that is noteworthy, I think, is what's come to be called reverse targeting. So 1968 statute told law enforcement, here's how you get a warrant. By the early 70s, this is all in the Church Commission report, by the early 70s, law enforcement's interested, particularly the Bureau of Dangerous Drones, whatever they were called, DEA's predecessor, interested in people in New York. We would surveil the foreign end of that link, an international call, in order to get information about the person in New York. Okay? 
Congress didn't appreciate that um, because it was a circumvention of the warrant requirement that needed just instituted in 1968. So <coughs> Congress passed, in, I guess bills were presented in 73, 74, 75, and 76 to regulate electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes. So you had this series of cases in which the courts got close but didn't quite say you have to go get authority from a court in order to engage in electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes. Congress sought to put an end to that through a statute. So if you look closely at the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, it doesn't use the word warrant when describing what you're going to get from the court. It calls it a court order. Um, what did Congress do? In 78, it created a secret court made up of district court judges. That court was put in place to hear applications uh, to, to conduct electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes. Its mission later grew, but that was the initial purpose. It defined electronic surveillance, so that's now a technical <coughs> definition. NSA was engaged in, in what it called electronic surveillance from 1952 on. The statute had a more circumscribed definition that sought to get at some of the problems that it had found in the 70s. And briefly and colloquially, these aren't quotes, but I'm going to set out for you what the four definitions are because it's important to later discussion. Targeting of the communications of a known U.S. person inside the United States. That was statutory electronic surveillance. You had to go to court and get an order if you wanted to do that. The acquisition of a communication, a excuse me, the acquisition of a wire communication when one end of the communication was in the United States and the collection took place in the United States. Okay? That was electronic surveillance under the statute. Go to court, get an order. And thirdly, the acquisition of a radio communication when all communicants were inside the United States. So you see the difference placement of the statute between wire communications and radio communications. An intentional difference. Okay? And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the fourth kind of catch-all category was if you want to do some sort of surveillance for which law enforcement need a Fourth Amendment warrant, you go to court and get an order. So Congress anticipated some changes in technology and sought to keep up with technology by creating that catch-all category. What the statute didn't address was the acquisition of international radio communications. And those were, um, at that time, the principal means by which international communications travel, BSM. So Congress intentionally left out of its definition of electronic surveillance, which you had to do all these things, <laughs> the principal means of collection of international communications. Okay? So how does the FISA from 1978 protect civil liberties? You had to go make an application to a court. You couldn't just start electronic surveillance. The Attorney General had to approve the application. The, you had to have a high-ranking executive branch official certify that the basis of the application was true and the purpose was to collect foreign intelligence. Um, there were restrictions in the statute about uh, the use of the information you collected. There was a criminal provision that um, prohibited information <coughs> of illegally collected activity. And significantly, the court approved what it called, what the statute called minimization procedures. Those procedures that the statute defines as a set of procedures that are designed to minimize the acquisition of and retention of and prohibit the dissemination of information concerning U.S. persons if it's not foreign intelligence. So the statute gave to the court a role to do all of those things overseeing the executive branch. And it worked pretty well. For NSA, it worked pretty well for a time. We continued our mission outside the United States, collecting international radio signals, no court order at all. That's the way it was designed. The, um, in the interim, two, two major things happened. One, the, United, the technology changed in, in a way predicted by uh, the physicist Negroponte, not the DNI Negroponte, but the physicist Negroponte, something called the Negroponte switch. He predicted uh, a couple decades ago that we'd reverse the whole world. So wire communications, short haul, would become the means of long haul international communications, and vice versa. Local communications would become wireless. Exactly what's happened. What, what difference does that make? That brought within the ambit of the SPICE statute international communications directed at non-US persons outside the United States. Something intentionally left out of the coverage of the statute in 1978 was brought under the coverage of the statute in the 90s. Not by any change in the statute, but by a change in technology. Those communications that came, used to come by international radio now come by wire terminated in the United States. That difference alone, coupled with the fact that the United States became a communications hub, 
all kinds of free communication services in the United States, free for the asking. Anybody in the world can use them. You have as many accounts or identities as you want. You don't have to tell the truth about who you are. You register for free, you use them for free. Those two things together created huge bandwidth of submarine cable between the continents coming to the United States. And that brought within the ambit of the statute international communications of foreign entities that had no connection in some cases with the United States except they stored their communications here. So what did that mean to us? It meant under the FISA we had to prioritize our intelligence collection. We had, we had, let's say we had X number of legitimate, we could agree they're all legitimate foreign intelligence targets outside the United States, non-US persons. We would take a fraction of X because we had to go through these procedures to get to the court. Okay? So we would literally prioritize the most important intelligence collection and do that in the most effective way. We still carried on our mission outside the United States, but we knew the one place the communications all converged was here. But the, the procedural burden was such that we couldn't get them all. Okay? That's how we find ourselves after 9-11. Eventually, and I won't, uh, I won't go into the ta details of, the, of what Charlie mentioned, the terrorist surveillance program. Happy to answer questions if you want to ask questions. But what I want to do is fast forward to the statutory basis on which we operate now, which is the FISA Amendments Act. In February 2006, I was one of two lawyers that went down to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and told them, we don't think this statute is doing what the drafters of it in 1978 thought it was doing then. We think its, it's entire effect has changed frustrating our foreign intelligence collection, um, and we'd like you to change it, and we had some ideas about how. That kicked off a debate in 2006, um, an interim statute in 2007, eventually uh, uh, culminating in the passage of the FISA Amendments Act in 2008. Okay, so I said to you at the beginning that, I was only taking minutes, so I said that um, my thesis is there's more protection for uh, civil liberties today under the foreign, FISA Amendments Act even though some of the restrictions have been loosened than there were before its passage. Why? Because, first of all, what did the act do? It did two major things. It allowed for surveillance <coughs> in the United States in ways that otherwise would be considered, and still are considered, in fact, electronic surveillance under the statute. So we can collect where we know those communications are and we can get them most reliably without individualized court orders as to each and every target. Okay? So it allows a broad certification by the DNI and Attorney General, but then we can add individual targets onto that certification without returning to court. Okay? That's a huge backlog that was cleared. The second major thing it did is it required, for the first time ever, court orders premised on probable cause for U.S. persons outside the United States. Right up until 2008, an order was never required to conduct electronic surveillance on those people. U.S. persons outside the United States. We did have to go to the Attorney General, get him to authorize us to do it, and make a showing to him of probable cause, but never court uh, supervision. So what we did is, what Congress did, is forgot about technology, forgot about location of surveillance, and instead looked at the target of surveillance and said, what do we owe this person? Okay? If it's a U.S. person anywhere in the world, that's one set of civil liberties recognition. If he's not a U.S. person, a whole different set, much less. That's not the way the statute was working before 2008. Okay, so under the FAA, what kind of, uh, what kind of protections do we have built in? Um, there is no individual probable cause showing, as I said, and that's what causes people to say it's an unconstitutional statute. That's the basis for the lawsuit we're facing right now. You must need a warrant because you're doing electronic surveillance. But the history of electronic surveillance law makes clear that's not the case. The Supreme Court's never said that. And as long as the surveillance is reasonable, it's, it's lawful under the Fourth Amendment, even though it's a search and seizure. Okay? So that's the one thing that was taken away is the individualized suspicion and probable cause. But um, we still have a DNI and AG certification that the purpose is foreign intelligence, that the procedures have been complied with up to that point. Um, there's four or five things they certify that are required by the statute before we can begin surveillance, before we can even go to the court. The court does now approve the, what we call the targeting procedures, which are those procedures that allow us to decide 
yeah, this person's outside the United States. We can follow this track, not this track, okay? So very important the court looks at those and finds those reasonable before we can begin. The court also still approves minimization procedures. Those procedures I described that are designed to minimize the acquisition and retention, prohibit the dissemination outside of NSA of information concerning U.S. persons that we're talking incidentally collected, right, because we're talking to people outside the United States. They might be talking to somebody in the U.S., they might not. If they are, we're not allowed to push that information out of the NSA unless we make an affirmative finding it's foreign intelligence information. There are still the statutory restrictions on use because we're still engaged in statutory electronic surveillance. There's still the criminal penalties um, for violations. And um, in terms of oversight, there are reports to Congress. There are DNI and AG oversight of our compliance with procedures. There are regular IG reviews. Um, there's all kinds of internal and external oversight, including reports to the court, just as there were under the 1978 statute. The court has never, in my experience, on its own come out and examined our compliance. In fact, it waits for us to report, hey, we have a compliance issue here. That's the way the court works. Worked that way in 1978, works that way today. But there are a lot more people and a lot more activity reviewing what we're doing, ensuring that we're complying with those procedures. So I believe that those two changes in the law um, have actually afforded more protection, not less. The probable cause feature was not the principal protection for U.S. persons incidentally collected, which is what we're talking about in the vast majority of those cases. And the laws impose a requirement for an actual court order to conduct electronic surveillance on people outside the United States. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a, that was a tour de force on, on the history. You said eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, who's counting? <laughs> Sir. Uh, we're very pleased to have Ginger McCall uh, from the Electronic Privacy and Information Center. Ginger is the assistant director of EPIC's Open Government Project, and she works on a variety of issues there. Um, she's co-editor of the Litigation Under Federal Government Laws, uh, edition 2010. She's co-authored uh, amicus briefs on privacy issues to the Supreme Court. She's provided expert commentary. In fact, one of my students, I mentioned that you were going to be here, and said, well, I see her on TV all the time, or something like this. Uh, for local, national, international media, including NPR, and MSNBC, and Al Jazeera. She's a graduate of Cornell Law School, uh, and she graduated uh, magnum cum laude from the University of Pittsburgh. While she was in law school, she was president of the Cornell Law School National Lawyers Guild and was awarded Cornell's Freeman Prize for Civil and Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so one of the major challenges in civil liberties in the cyber age is the fact that the law has simply not kept pace with the technology. Both the courts and, and the Congress have had a very hard time actually keeping up with what's going on. So it, there was a law enacted in 1986, which that's quite a long time ago from a technological standpoint, uh, called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And this was meant to be a stopgap until, con until constitutional jurisprudence, that is the Fourth Amendment, caught up to the technology. Uh, this law, it actually has three subsections within it, the Stored Communications Act, the Wiretap Act, and the Pen Register Act. But to give you an example of, of how complicated this law is and where some of the problems are in it from a, a modern technology standpoint, um, so let's say that you draft an email and you store that on your home computer. That would be given full protection of the Fourth Amendment against any sort of government intrusion. Now, if you were to draft that email on Gmail or some other cloud computing service, uh, a webmail service, it would be subject only to a subpoena. All that the government has to do to access that email is to produce a subpoena. Uh, doesn't have to get any sort of court oversight involved. Now, once that email is in transit, when you send it, for that time period when it is in transit between your inbox and your uh, email box and someone else's inbox, it's protected again by a warrant protection. The government has to get a warrant in order to be able to access that. Uh, that's under the Wiretap Act. Once that email is received by the recipient and uh, it's sitting in their email inbox and it is unopened, it's protected under the Stored Communications Act and still requires a warrant. Once it's opened, if, this is, if it's been in that inbox for less than 180 days and it is open, then all that the government has to have is a subpoena to see it. 
Um, and once that 180 day mark passes, which this seems very arbitrary because it is, uh, once the 180 day mark passes, then all that's necessary is a subpoena, whether it's open or it's unopen. So you can see that there's quite a bit of, of a problem here, a real inconsistency in the way that information is protected under this act. Um, and, and adding to this problem is the fact that the courts haven't kept up uh, under the Fourth Amendment doctrine with protecting emails. Um, the Fourth Amendment would require that there be a warrant, um, but that hasn't necessarily borne out in, in all the circuits across the country. And there's also uh, a technological differentiation here. Uh, if you store something on your home computer, it requires a warrant to be accessed. But if you store something in cloud computing, there's a much lesser uh, level of proof that the government has to put forward in order to view that. And cloud computing is its any sort of service that you would normally have done back in the 90s on your computer that now you've sort of outsourced to some external server. Um, you know, we see it with pictures. If you're storing your pictures on Picasa or Flickr, that's a cloud computing service. If you're doing webmail with Gmail, that's a cloud computing service. Where you might have, in 1999, stored your email at home on your computer in Outlook, now that email is being held on some sort of external server, which gives you, as a user, a much less control over that information. And one of the important definitions of privacy from our standpoint is that it's user control over information. You get to hold your information. You get to decide who sees that information, who sees your emails, who knows this particular piece of information about you. Um, so there's a differentiation now between cloud computing services and home computing services, but the technology is moving more and more toward cloud computing. Uh, there was a recent Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals case, uh, U.S. v. Warshak, which you mentioned, uh, where the court, in fact, did decide that email is protected under the Fourth Amendment. There, the, the issue in that case was actually uh, Enzite, which you may have seen their commercials. Um, they had a very popular uh, advertising character, Smiling Bob, and they were brought up on... For, an for men with self-esteem. Yes, issues. yes. <laughs> Uh, they were brought up under a number of charges, and as part of that investigation, law enforcement <coughs> was looking at uh, emails by one of the heads of the company. And they compelled the ISP, the internet service provider, to turn over emails without a warrant. And uh, the court in the Court of Appeals in Warshak decided that this was, in fact, not allowed under the Fourth Amendment. There are two questions that you have to ask under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, whether the person had a subjective expectation of privacy, that is, they personally believed that, that that information was private, and whether society is willing to recognize that expectation of privacy. Now, as the court concluded in this case, it's obvious that most people believe that they have an expectation of privacy in their email. If you can pose an email on Gmail, you send it to a friend, you, you believe that that person is going to be the only person who sees that email. If you were to compose a draft on Gmail and save it in your drafts folder, you would certainly expect that, that you would be the only one who would be seeing that email. And perhaps in Google in particular, that perhaps one of their computers might be scanning that and then delivering you ads based on that, but that there wouldn't be another human being who would be intercepting that email and reading it. Uh, in particular, that the government would not be reading that email. And so the question that the court asked um, is, is society ready to recognize an expectation of privacy in email? Society has recognized an expectation of privacy in phone calls and in letters, but, but can we now expand that into email? And one of the arguments that they made was that email has, has pretty much eclipsed letters as a way of communication in this technology age. Personal and business communications, um, love letters, secrets, proprietary business information, confidential legal communications between attorneys and their clients are all sent via email now. Um, and US mail is, is it's on its way out, it seems. Um, and the court looked to uh, Kylo versus United States, uh, in, in which that court found that the Fourth Amendment must keep pace with technology. And they applied that, and they found that the principles that are relevant to letters and phone calls are also relevant to email. So there is an expectation of privacy in email, thus it is protected under the Fourth Amendment and it does require a warrant. Uh, as the court said, as some forms of communication begin to diminish, the Fourth Amendment must recognize and protect nascent ones that arise. So this was a, a very important finding from a civil liberty standpoint. 
We've also seen a few other recent cases which touched on uh, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, there was a case of Twitter where the federal government wanted information about Twitter users who were WikiLeaks volunteers. Uh, and they went to Twitter with, um, with an order under the Stored Communications Act and, and requested that information. And uh, Twitter actually, they, they fought it, I believe, and managed to notify their users at least that this information was being turned over to the government. There's still some activity in that case and it might in fact get appealed up um, to the Court of Appeals. There was also City of Ontario versus Kwan, which was a case that we wrote a Supreme Court amicus brief on. In that case, there was a federal employee, a police SWAT member, who had been sending text messages. Uh, the text messages, there was a formal policy within, the, um, within his employer's office, which was a government employer, that those text messages would be subject to surveillance, but there was an informal policy that, in fact, they wouldn't be subject to surveillance as long as the officers paid for any overages above and beyond um, what the company limit was on those. So if the officers used enough text messages that there was an additional charge, they would pay the additional charge and then the text messages wouldn't necessarily be monitored or read by the superiors. Um, this case went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually declined to rule on the issue of whether or not there was a reasonable expectation of privacy in those text messages. Uh, instead, they just skipped on to the next question of whether or not the search was reasonable. And actually that is, is somewhat illustrative of what happens with courts and, and privacy issues is a lot of times when you're looking at a Fourth Amendment issue where there's technology involved, the court simply declines to rule on the issue. Um, and this kind of compounds the problem with technology and, and what do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in, which creates privacy, pro which creates problems not just for users, but it creates privacy if, problems for companies. If you are a company that receives a request from the federal government for user information, can you turn that user information over, or will you be <coughs> violating, uh, will you be violating ECPA? Uh, it creates problems for the government. Can you request this information? What do you need in order to be able to request this information? A subpoena, a warrant, a court order? What is it? Um, and so the basic problem from a privacy standpoint with subpoenas instead of warrants is that there's a lack of oversight there. Uh, there's no court approval required. And this is the same problem that we see with national security letters and classification and um, exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. The government essentially says, trust us, and, and this has played out in, in several of the earlier panels today, that, that we are simply supposed to, to trust the government, but the American public has real reason not to trust the government. Uh, for instance, the FBI national security letter abuses. Uh, 2007 Inspector General's report found that there were 17% more national security letters used than the FBI was reporting. There were about 4,600 uh, national security letters that weren't reported to Congress. And there were about 22 violations out of a sample of, of 293 of these national security letters, which was far more than the FBI was reporting. So, this is the problem with the lack of insight, uh, oversight. If you don't have some sort of, of court oversight of what's happening with executive agencies, a lot of times there are abuses. And it's difficult for the American public to simply trust what the government is doing when we see these instances of abuse. Now there was a, a question brought up of the importance of privacy. And a lot of times privacy gets lost as a principle in these debates because privacy itself is somewhat esoteric. It's, it's a high abstract value. Um, it's not something that has nearly as much image impact as something like a terrorist attack. You, know, you can't take a picture necessarily of someone's privacy being violated by their Gmail being read by, by some federal officer who shouldn't necessarily have access to it. Um, but the real value in privacy is you can't have any sort of robust democracy without it. You can't have a robust democracy without the ability to dissent, to discuss, and to disagree with your government without constantly having to look over your shoulder. Um, we've seen a lot of abuses in this area. A few years ago, there was a, a news article that reported that in Maryland, peaceful anti-war protester groups had been surveilled and infiltrated by federal agents, uh, and then names of people involved in those groups were actually entered into a sort of fusion center database, and these people were branded as terrorists. Uh, we've also seen federal agents surveilling Facebook, which is a problem. There is some expectation of privacy, at least on Facebook, from, from the users there. 
there are people who argue against this, but the problem, what, what we see is that most people, uh, even, even in the youth demographic, really do attempt to control their information on Facebook. They try to set those privacy settings. But a Columbia study recently found that 100% of people surveyed are sharing more than they think they are on Facebook. And that's in large part because that company keeps on changing its policies. So you'll think that you have your information protected, only your friends can view it, and then that information is being broadcast out into the world. Um, there, there, was, there were some earlier remarks on panels about privacy and government secrecy and, and kind of equating these two things together, that, that people have privacy, governments are allowed to have secrecy. But there, there's a real difference there. People have a privacy right that, that is in the Constitution. You have a right against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, governments don't, don't have that same right. The governments exist to serve the, the people. Every person in this room who is employed by the federal government and all of the people in, outside of this room who are employed by the federal government, your employer is the American public. Your employer is, is the taxpayer. You have to account for the way that you spend that money. You have to account for the activities that you're taking. And while there is obviously some operational necessity to having secrecy about the details of certain projects, the details of certain operations, what we've seen is a real attitude that treats secrecy, you know, the, the secrecy that you're creating is against the American public. It's not just against some kind of foreign threat. You know, when we have the existence of entire agencies being denied, there, there's no reason, foreign threat-wise, that you have to deny the existence of an entire agency. State secrets cases where there's an unwillingness to even acknowledge programs, uh, like the El Nasri case, and, and the warrantless wiretapping cases where there's an unwillingness to disclose details on a supposedly discontinued program. We filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the government for, for memos about this program, a program that has been said to be discontinued. And still, in those memos, pretty much entire pieces of paper, entire pieces of those memos were exempted by the time that we got them. And the government fought us for years over this. We filed this Freedom of Information Act request, I believe, in, in 2005 or 2006, and they fought us for years in court over it. And by the time that we did get the documents, there were still exemptions. This is a supposedly discontinued program. There's no reason to, to be exempting and, and keeping secret the details of the memos that authorized it. So this isn't secrecy for national security's sake, it's secret, secrecy for non-accountability's sake. Thank you very much, Ginger, uh, terrific. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Professor Jeff Atticott. Uh, we know each other for, for many years. Uh, Jeff is currently the Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of the Center <coughs> for Terrorism Law at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. He served on active duty as an Army Judge Advocate uh, for more than 20 years. Hard for me to believe that you retired in 2000. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but I guess it has been. Uh, Jeff has built a center down there. Uh, he's been a frequent, he's another person you see on, on television, here on the radio a lot. He's been on Fox News, MSNBC, any number of radio programs. He's the author of more than 20 books and articles and monographs. And his current book is Terrorism Law, Cases, Materials, and Comments, the sixth edition, which came out just uh, this year in, in 2011. Um, while in the Army, he was named the Army Judge Advocate of the Year. He has his uh, SJD, um, his Master's of Law from the SJD and Master's of Law from the University of Virginia. He also has a Master's of Law from the Army Judge Advocate General School, and his JD is from the University of Alabama <coughs> School of Law. And in 2007, he was the recipient of St. Mary's University School of Law Distinguished Faculty Award. Jeff? Thank you, General. I, I really appreciate you uh, inviting me here. I think I was here uh, about 10, 11 years ago uh, when, this, um, when these conferences were first starting up, so it's a privilege to be back. I'd like to look a little bit at more of a macro sense. I know my two colleagues have done an excellent job because I, I learned a lot, great overview on the FISA issue, um, and of course I reminded of some of the things that the Tea Party has really brought to mind. People are actually starting to read the Constitution again. And as you know, the 13 states refused to sign the Constitution when it was offered to them because they said, there's no way. We want a Bill of Rights. And we want some of these concepts that we associate now and take for granted in many cases, associated with privacy. 
But we always have that tension between increased security and civil liberties and privacy and where do you draw the line? And that's one of the things we do at our center and in this center also. You, you know, you debate the issue and that's what you do in a free society is you have these debates, you look at these concepts. Um, anybody read the 9-11 Commission Report? You know, it's kind of a light reading. The, the basic bottom line of the 9-11 Commission Report, they said, lack of imagination. Do you think anybody in American Airlines, some of the security professionals went to the boss and said, you know boss, we ought to put a locking door on the cockpit, an impenetrable door so nobody can kick the door in and cut the pilot's throat. Think that thought ever occurred to anybody? Yeah, a lot of times. Why didn't they do it? It cost money. What, seven, eight thousand dollars a pop to replace the doors? And Benjamin Franklin, his words ring true. Penny uh, wise and pound foolish. Uh, great novelist Rebecca West, she said, the trouble with man is two things. He cannot learn those truths that are too complicated, and he forgets those truths that are too simple. Boy, was she right. Um, okay, so cybersecurity in the big picture. I took my kids uh, about three months ago to the Palladium, which is a gigantic theater in San Antonio, state of the art. We're gonna watch, I think, um, uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs or something. Went to the front there and, and said, what time, you know, we're here to buy our tickets. What time does it start? We don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? Computers are down. Don't you have a printout, you know, the old-fashioned way? To no, no idea, no idea. I said, wow, okay. Well, my point is that uh, everything runs in cyber now. Everything runs in cyber from A to Z. In fact, 85% of our critical infrastructure, the power plants, the banking systems, the transportation, medical communications, they, uh, they operate, you know, with computers. You don't have people, you know, turning the knobs and turning the switches anymore. Everything operates uh, via computers. And again, 85% of this is in the hands of private industry. And when they build their computer systems, they also have security systems that are built to protect information. Is that their primary goal? No, they're built primarily for efficiency. And security is kind of a secondary issue. And everybody does it a little bit differently. And that's part of what free enterprise is all about. And privacy and capitalism, what makes this country great. Now, uh, that's the reality. Here's the problem. Bad guys realize that also. And you don't need a bomb anymore to create massive terror or death and destruction. If you can hack into a computer system, a SCADA, the brains that run these things, and tell it to do untoward things, you can create havoc, uh, absolute pandemonium. So the th same thing that, that happened, the 9-11 Commission talked about lack of imagination, in my opinion, is mimicking itself in the cyber world. And we are due for a 9-11 cyber event that's going to knock our socks off. And we are totally unprepared for it totally unprepared. So how do we get prepared for it? If we, if we accept the premise that private industry controls most of the things that make life go for us in this country, who's responsible for developing viable cybersecurity standards? Should the government do it? Should the private industry do it? And that's the tension. Now, since the government's been thinking about cybersecurity, every administration, whether Republicans or Democrats, their policy has been one of engagement. And if you, again, I don't want to plug my book, but I've got a chapter on cyber in there, and you can read all the different strategies and the plans and the, and the executive orders and, and et cetera, et cetera. It's all about engagement with the civilian community. We want the civilian community, tell us when you've had a breach so we can develop templates and figure out better ways to effectively develop cybersecurity standards to protect things. Um, that has gone over like a lead balloon because as my colleague indicated, when the government comes in and says, hi, we're the government, we're here to help you. Most capitalists grab a hold of their wallets. You know, we don't want your help, thank you very much. So it really hasn't worked. Now one credit to the Obama administration, they are actually leaning forward in the saddle more than previous administrations because what they're trying to promote is, is a strategy of regulation. We know that government computers are regulated. There are standards that are set for government computers that you have to have in order to operate those computers. And of course, if you're in the military these days, they, uh, you know, they about do a, a strip search before you walk into a building. They take your, you know, your cell phones, your iPads, your, your laptops, and, and everything, and put it in a drawer, and then lock it up, and then you go in the, in the system. Um, and so that's fine. So we do have regulations uh, for government computers. But the other 85%, with some exceptions, it's like the wild, wild west. So the Obama administration says, well, we need to regulate these things. We need to establish standards by, that, are, that, are, that are universal. And we could probably vary them across the various industries that I've just described that are involved in critical infrastructure issues in this country. Um, a couple of problems with that, of course, is who's gonna develop the standards? And as you know, by the time you buy your iPod and walk out of the store and get home and say, honey, look at the new gadget, a week later, it's obsolete. They got a new gadget, a new, new gadget. So by the time, even if you could develop cybersecurity standards, they'd be obsolete because you know how fast our bureaucracy works in this country. 
By the time you develop the standards by committee, it, it's OBE. Um, and then who are you going to get to develop, develop the standards? Most of the smart people that have the, the technology and the wherewithal to do it, they don't want to work for the government unless you can make them SESs. They want to work for the man because you can make more money. And most Americans are still good capitalists. Um, and so as a practical matter, if, even if you could try to develop the standards, who's going to do it? And, and, and once you have the standards, is it too late? So foreign nations realize these vulnerabilities. Terrorists realize these vulnerabilities. And of course, most of the cybersecurity breaches, if you did a, if you did a Venn diagram, it's Homer Simpson asleep at the wheel. You know, human error of some sort, and you have half the East Coast goes dark. The next biggest threat is really competitors and criminals. And nobody knows how many billions of dollars is lost uh, for the efforts of criminals and competitors that want to harm uh, the competition. And then, of course, terrorism is, is very sexy, but it's, very, it's, it's a very small sliver. There have been cases uh, where individuals have hacked into critical infrastructures and have done bad things. Uh, the Botec case in Australia, a disgruntled employee hacked into the, the computer and ordered the sewage plant in Australia to release the sewers and caused hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Didn't have to <coughs> strap a bomb on themselves, didn't have to do anything, just hacked into the computer. Suppose you could hack into the power plant, uh, the Seabrook nuclear reactor, and say, stop cooling the rods. Is that possible? Yes, yeah, possible. There are a lot of possibilities. A lot of these attacks, of course, are occurring all the time. So back to my point, who's going to protect us, and does the government have an obligation? Uh, you know, the Constitution says the, the, the basic premise of our government is to provide for the common defense and provide for the general welfare. True or false? False. Provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare. We're not a socialist state yet. So they're supposed to promote the general welfare, but has our dependence on, on computers and technology, is it a commons, and this is a legal technical word, that has it developed into a commons where the government has to do it? It's not a nice thing to have anymore. We are so dependent on, on cyber that it could be considered a commons and therefore the government has an obligation not just to engage but to do something, to do something. Um, uh, you can make that, that argument. My idea of how this should best work though is what's going to happen. Remember Connie Francis? Anybody? I know you old timers are in there. A great country singer back in the day in the 60s. She was raped in a Howard Johnson motel in the 60s and she sued. And back then she got a, over a million dollar judgment um, because tort liability. You know, you had a duty to protect me. I'm on the premises, approximate cause. You breached the duty, uh, and uh, I was injured. And of course, the, we, we look at this under reasonableness, which is that lovely word that lawyers love to use. And the judge said, yeah, your, cyber, your security standards, your physical security standards were not reasonable. You lose your $1 million. Now, all of a sudden, across the hotel and motel industry, you started to have locks on doors. You started to have lighting in the parking lot. You started to have security on the windows. Today, every hotel is like Fort Knox. I mean, you've got latches and locks and everything else, uh, which, which is fine. But what motivated them? Was it the virtue inherent in capitalism that it's the right thing to do? No. <laughs> they saw an individual in the community that was sued for large amounts of money, and that's what motivated them. We're going to need something like that in the cyber world. And a lot of people think in their businesses about physical security, but they don't really think about cyber security because they don't want to spend the money on cyber security. So yeah. Agents or workers in various companies, Texaco, Exxon, whatever the industry is, they've gone to the boss and said, look, we need more money to beef up our cybersecurity standards because if someone hacks into our system and bad things happen, we're going to get sued. And then we're going to have to go into court and we're going to have to make the argument that, Your Honor, our cybersecurity standards were reasonable. What does that mean? Whatever the judge says it means. Now, where's the judge going to find out whether it's reasonable or not? Well, they can go to industry standards. They can look at government standards for government computers and they can draw a line somewhere, and then they'll look at your practices, and they'll say, well, your standards are above or below this line that I've developed. So you want to go into the court if you do have a cyber security breach and injury occurs. You want to say, look, here's the industry standard, here's the government standard, Your Honor, and I'm 15% above that. Therefore, we're not expected to, to be secure from every threat, but we're just supposed to take reasonable measures. Um, that's your, what you want to be able to do in a business community, and that, that's, that's the word that, that should be spread. But it won't happen until we have a lawsuit. Now, two other statutes. California has led the way about uh, seven years ago. They passed a, a statute. And Texas is actually one of these states also. And they mandate that businesses have to have reasonable cybersecurity standards. So it's by statute and tort law, common law tort law, Anglo-Saxon stuff. Um, Texas has the same thing, 2006 Texas Business Act. You have to have reasonable cybersecurity. What does reasonable mean? 
Again, we're, we're right back to that, and I suggested how you would approach that. If you actually were a lawyer and in-house counsel working for one of these companies, you'd go to the boss and say, look, we better prepare now. But really, practically, nobody's preparing because they're all saying, well, it's going to happen to some other company. We don't want to spend the money to do it to us. And when the shark gets that person in the water, then we'll get motivated. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of my premise about you know, the privacy, private industry, capitalism on the one hand, and the need for security. And what is our government doing to secure us? Because we are, the cyber is the lifeblood for our, for our culture, for everything that we do. And we've got to pay more attention to it. So I support the Obama efforts to try to increase the regulatory side of this, um, of this scale. Now, not just engagement, but, but you know, try to promote regulation, try to promote and create an atmosphere where businesses can be educated about this uh, looming threat. And it's coming. It's coming. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That, that was a passionate approach to this, to this issue, to a very difficult issue. Let me ask the panel a question. In terms of ensuring uh, privacy and, and picking up from what Jeff said and motivating private industry in particular, well, hey, let me ask two questions. One, do we think that the threat to our privacy comes from as much from private industry mishandling personal information and letting it get out and, and exploiting it, or is it from the government? And if in either event, should there be better ways, at least in the civil lawsuit arena, of addressing those particular kinds of breaches of privacy? Ginger, do you want to take a, a shot at that? It certainly comes from both. It's slightly different threat from either side. And we actually do work on both private sector threats and public sector threats at Epic. Um, what we've seen, though, is on this issue of data breaches and, and private sector, um, a lot of times we'll see a bill come up, there'll be a draft of the bill, we'll look at this draft, originally it'll have a statutory damages and a private right of action built into it, every single time that gets eviscerated before the bill is ever dropped to the public. And the statutory damages here are particularly important because again, a privacy right, even a data breach, is, is very esoteric. A lot of times if, if someone breaches your data, if there's a company and they mishandle your data and your social security number gets out, you don't have any recourse until you suffer some sort of monetary damage from that. So just the fact that your social security number and your name pairing got out, you, know, you don't have any kind of rec recourse until someone actually uses that and you suffer monetary damage. With, with a, the privacy right that's infringed upon there, it's even more difficult to show some sort of real monetary damage. It, it's, a, it's a very esoteric right, and so it's hard to prove that in court, which is why it's very important under these sorts of statutes to have statutory damages built in that say, you know, you don't have to prove a monetary damage. You will get, by default, you know, $2,000, $4,000, and that really builds in a disincentive to these companies to be irresponsible with that data. And it's very important also to have a private right of action built into these because you can't necessarily trust the FTC to enforce against every company that engages in some sort of practice that allows for a data breach. You can't necessarily trust the regulatory powers. And this, uh, a private right of action vests then in the individual consumer the ability for recourse. Do you have anything for Patrick? Do you have any observations on that? My only thought, and it responds both to something Jeff said and, and Ginger's most recent comment, is yes, private rights of action can cause a disincentive. But these companies, from my perspective, are not in the main losing data because of negligence. They're having their lunch eaten by sophisticated computer intruders. And so I guess I side in some sense with Suzanne, who said, this, is, this is, appears to be a losing game to some extent right now. I guess that's where the question of reasonableness comes in. And we have seen and we filed complaints to the FTC on companies that were on notice of the fact that you know, their handling of data was perhaps irresponsible and going to eventually lead to some sort of data breach. A lot of times they simply disregard that because again, it's that question of do we put up money up front right now to fix this problem or do we just assume that we're not gonna be the unlucky one who gets hit? There's another doctrine out there coming from California uh, that you might have heard about, I can't remember the case, but uh, it's called the Encourage Free Radicals Doctrine, which says that if your business, if your, if your security standards in your business are so bad that you attract individuals to use the botnets to go through you as a slave to get to somebody else, that you can be sued. 
even if you don't do it, but your, your security standards were so bad that you attracted individuals to go into your cybersecurity to attack somebody else, then you're gonna be liable for the, uh, for the breaches that occur on the other end. This is a, kind of a developing doctrine in California, which you, there's a couple of law review articles out there that are, that are written on it, which is kind of a developing, uh, a developing uh, concept, which is interesting. I also think, and I'm not disputing anything that's been said, I think that's true, but I also think there can be an economic incentive. If you look at a company like Google, which we, there was an earlier conversation about opt-in, opt-out, right? Google has made its encryption opt-out rather than opt-in. So now your Google email is encrypted unless you do something to stop that. That's going to affect other providers in complex positions. They're going to pressure them to do the same because there's economic benefit in providing that service, even though people are largely unaware of it before the possibility before Google did it. It also goes to that question of what is the industry standard when That's you're right. looking at reasonableness and it, so it's very helpful for a company like Google to engage in that. Let's open it up to the, the audience here. If there are, I have a couple of questions here, but I, I want to open it up to the audience first. Does anybody have any questions or comments for the for the panelists? Joel? Yes, sir. Just a, just a comment. I think a lot of times people assume there's information that they would just love to share on the internet. Uh, like, for example, I guess everyone agree, would agree here that their birth date would be part of their personal identifiable information. Well, in the past year, um, I've gotten two <coughs> birthday wishes from people in government who I didn't give my birthday to. <laughs> I don't know why on earth they would have access to my birth date. But, you know, other than it being maybe friendly sucking up to a potential vote, I don't understand why someone in government who is not a recipient for motor vehicle purposes or some other purposes would have my birthday. And I, I mean, I wrote back to the individual. I said, please do not send me, you know, nice wishes like that. But I'm just curious wh why people would be so free or have access to that type of personally identifiable information if they do not have a necessity to have that information. Ginger, do you want to? And this really goes to an idea that's that's called fair information practices. And one of one of the principles under that is that information in this instance, personal information, should be should be minimized in so much as you should only have that information if you need to have that information for some sort of articulable reason. And and what we've seen in government and also in industry is that people are holding on to vast amounts of information. Uh, because the cost of storage is very cheap now. You can store that information very cheaply. There's no particular incentive to get rid of it. So information that's not necessarily uh, necessary for the information, necessary for that organization's purpose is being, being held and there's access to that by people who don't necessarily need to have it. I, I would also suggest if you Googled your own name and your own birth date, it'd be very interesting to see what came up. There may be something out there on the web and I think we're going to see more and more of this, that somebody put on <laughs> in there in college some, you know, biography or, or even, a, even a resume of some sort that had a lot of information that people, people can get this information and infuse it in a way either through companies or even privately. It's just amazing what you can find out about people just Googling. But it is disconcerting and mildly creepy <laughs> or majorly creepy that somebody in government would send you, that wasn't a close personal friend, would send you a birthday card because you do wonder, A, how do you come to their attention, and B, how do they get your birthday, and C, why are they sending you this? <laughs> Not to get too paranoia, but I think I hear the black helicopters overhead. But, um, yes, ma'am. I think this, go I'm going to ask the panelists, but I think this goes to one of, you've asked what I think is one of the central questions of modern society. To what degree are we prepared to give up our personal civil liberties, our personal privacy, in, in order to get more security? Historically in this country, we've given up a lot of security to maintain personal civil liberties and, and privacy. I'm wondering if that that paradigm is changing because, um, again, as we were talking over lunch, 
look at what's happened since 9-11 in terms of giving up your personal privacy every time you travel, uh, the growth in national security letters, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ginger, but I think that same IG report found 200,000 national security letters. 200,000 national security letters were issued as a result of 9-11, yet every year, or since 9-11, we've had 150,000 people in this country killed by non-state actors, murdered. Yet we don't even think about giving up the whole notion of warrant requirement and everything else to address that very real threat to our security. So it may be, it would be interesting to hear other people's view and our panelists, have our, has our sense of security and what we're willing to give up for it become somehow skewed because of the high profile nature of you know, a 9-11 type terrorist event. Colleagues, what? Well, you have to extrapolate. I mean, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is slow and uh, the standard we have is that it's a subjective understanding that society is willing to bear. What does that mean? I mean, it means whatever the Supreme Court says it means. So we look at cases, we try to extrapolate, we, we wait with bated breath for a circuit court to come out with an opinion so that we can talk about it and debate it. But the, the technology is moving so fast um, that, you know, can the legal standards keep up with it? Um, I just know in the context, we had a bill introduced just uh, last session between Chuck Schumer and uh, Lindsey Graham. And uh, they were proposing to make a social security card that, had, that, was, that was essentially foolproof, had biometric information on it. Because if you know, if you have your social security card, I think they still have the same stock of paper that they made in the 1930s, because it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Same blue ink, same everything. Easiest document to forge in the world. Um, but if you had a biometric identification card, as every nation in Europe has a national identity card. Today, you know, you can get a beer. Every college student knows I'm going to get a different driver's license so I can go and you know, show it to, to the doorman from Idaho. And I'm, not, you know, I'm 21, but really I'm 19. But if you had that card and you, swept, and you, were, you had to swipe it as an employer, um, a lot of civil libertarians oppose that. Now, Lindsey Graham, of course, is a moderate conservative, and, and uh, Schumer is on the left. But it's amazing that they came together and crafted this bill because if you had that card, imagine uh, what would happen. You would see a lot of illegal aliens going back to where they came from because they can't get a job anymore. Uh, but the civil libertarians say, well, then the man's going to know about us. Guess what? If you pay taxes, the man already knows about you. And uh, so you are not going to be targeted. They already know everything about you. But it's people that operate in the shadows that, that would be. But Jeff, wasn't some of the objection to that card is that it'd become ubiquitous and you'd have you'd be swiping it all the time so that you would be building this publicly, this this record in government of almost your every move. Every time you went to a restaurant, you wouldn't get into this building unless you swipe that and your gall would be fused yep. into a giant database. And those giant databases already exist. They're called fusion centers and they aggregate information. Uh, everything from the hotel that you stay at, the airline you fly at, uh, airline you fly on, your visit to Disney World, um, as well as federal agencies, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Education, they all aggregate information in this one big place. And who your friends are. They can put your yep. face up and find all the people that you network with, where they are, and then go down the tree to other people. That's yep. what they are developing. But we, before and I we think, uh, oh, I wanted, to, I wanted to speak to the question, too. I think there are two things going on here. The first is that there's a vast overestimation of, of risk in, in national security, particularly in the airport context. Uh, what we see here is a lot of, of what a security expert, Bruce Schneier, has dubbed national security theater. Uh, the TSA in particular is in the business of making people believe that they're safe. Not necessarily making them much safer, but making them believe that they're safe. Uh, the images that we see of 9-11, of, of airplanes blowing up, it's a very visceral image and you have a very visceral reaction. But, I mean, the truth of the matter there is, if you're going to fly somewhere, the most dangerous part of your trip is still the drive to the airport. You know, we could make people, I suppose, much more, much safer in their vehicles if we were to invest huge amounts of money in that and, and those sorts of things. And that, you know, there are far more people killed in traffic accidents every year than in these sorts of attacks. And yet, there's a, there's a focus, there's almost an obsession on that. And the second thing that's going on, you know, when we say that Americans are willing to simply surrender their civil liberties in, in favor of security, I don't necessarily know that that's true. I think that a lot of times what's happening there is that people aren't, 
people are not made aware by the government of what the government is up to. And, and when that information actually leaks and people find out that there are these uh, wiretapping programs going on that uh, what body scanner machines actually do, uh, what, what the government is actually up to, there is a public outcry about that. And we saw that very much with the body scanner machines and the campaign that we've done about them. Uh, you know, we, what we found in the documents that we obtained from the Transportation Security Administration as part of a Freedom of Information Act request is that the machines have capabilities that TSA never told the American public about uh, and that they have uh, the incapability to detect powdered explosives. Um, and so people are relying uh, on some, some things that the government is telling them that are not necessarily true and accurate and they are weighing things uh, in a way that is not necessarily informed. And I think this is where government transparency about you know, what's really up, what really is the capability of, of this security system, you know, th those sorts of things are important in order to be able to have an informed public that votes in an informed way and in order to be able to have any kind of robust democracy. Obviously not specific details of those programs that might allow for circumvention, but some, some, more, some higher level of honesty and, and accountability there. But fortunately, tomorrow we're going to have a whole panel on airport security, so we'll be able to get into that in some detail. Uh, and before we start thinking, you know, government's too nefarious, uh, the 9-11 report really did have condemnations of government on exactly those lines. Why didn't you share information? And uh, one thing I will say for Stuart Baker's book, which I'm not a huge fan of, I must say, but one point he does say in there is that the, the previous arrangement was deliberate. There was a deliberate wall between intelligence information and law enforcement information. And it did exist for civil liberties. It wasn't all about inefficiency of government or, or cultural differences between the intelligence and law enforcement agency. It was much there for a reason. And that's much been torn down because politicians believe that the public wants it that way. And I think Ginger may have a very good point. How much does the, the public know? The government will do, I, I'm still optimistic enough to believe that government will be responsive to the people once the people tell the government what they want, but how much that, that is being conveyed. But that's why we have forums like this. Will, Professor Curtis. Will. I, this, this is a comment. I do think that there's a generational gap between old guys like me and my perception of the government's role regarding security and divulging of personal information. I notice on, on their adver advertisements on TV back in Maryland where it, this, this lady comes on and she says, I can go online and when I ask for a babysitter or a, 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 a repairman, I can get his total background. I'll know the individual before uh, he even gets here to do the job. It seems to me that that's a business opportunity for a company to do the type of background checks, require information, and that's not government involvement. I that's think that's a, that's a terrifically good point. Uh, people have, an ex especially younger people, they have an expectation that they can, will be able to get a lot of information. And so the commercial standards have almost demanded that somebody put their whole life out there in order to get the business. What, I don't know, what, what, does, what does our panel think about that? I mean, that's a bit, you know, if you, go to the, if you go to a nude beach and they complain because, you know, people are taking your picture, you know, so a lot of these contacts are people that put that information out. They, well, they, they do that. See, now, I would disagree. If you go to a nude beach and you complain because people are taking your well, picture, no, there are two picture. different things going on there. You're going there with the expectation that what you're doing will be transient, that you will go, not with, not with the expectation that what you're doing will be, will be permanent and it will possibly be disseminated out to, to well, the Miami public. Miami Beach, I mean, they're, yeah, you go down to Miami Beach and you know, take part of your clothes off, that's what a lot of people do, and then they, you, know, you might complain, well, you know, somebody <coughs> took a photograph of me, well, you know. Well, actually, that would be a violation of a federal statute, uh, the Video Voyeurism Prevention Act. You're it's not allowed. Not no, you're not allowed to take pictures of people's uh, private parts without their consent. You know, um, uh, 
I guess you would imply consent there, but, but that, that might be problematic. <laughs> just just because you're well, product, you take product. off your okay, clothes well, in your I, own bedroom. You actually, might I think not Patrick has a point on taken this. There. My point is that the, the courts have said if you're in a public place and you expose yourself to that setting, generally you can't then say, well, I you know I, I want my privacy. It's a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's not privacy in every context. So if you go out in public. Or if you're if you're trying to engage in business and they require that you know I want to see all the different jobs you've had, do you agree that I can get comments of people that have referred you know talked about or critiqued your work, and, and you say yes, I mean, you know, if you get a bad critique, you can't say, well, I got a bad critique. Well, now I, I think it's a illustrative of. That's not what they're doing. They're saying that I can get a background check on you, and when when having spent 21 years in the Mac in the military, background check to me. When I got top secret clearance, meant everything from the day I was born to food. To, to from the day I was born to that that current period in which they're doing the background check. So, background check to me means a thorough investigation. Everybody from my grandparents all the way through, <coughs> and 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 that's the perception I have. This lady says, "Well, if I want to babysit, I can get a background check." On and that's very problematic, and this, this goes to the fusion centers as well, because oftentimes there are information in those databases that, that is not correct, and it can have a profound effect on people's lives, their ab ability to obtain employment, uh, I mean, all of these things, it can really create a very real problem for someone. And I mean, this is why we have the Privacy Act, because the Privacy Act allows you, if a government has some sort of database, to to petition for correction of inaccurate information. But with these private companies, there isn't necessarily that same right. So, so, so a couple things. Um, I think on the question of the background check, it's a term that may mean what you think it means or may not mean what you think it means. I suspect it's a criminal activity, right? They've been arrested and convicted. That's a public record. Something I'd want to know before I had a babysitter, in fact. I think your point's exactly right, Charlie, that we lose sight of the fact that the wall that Turns out the court said the executive branch created that didn't exist, even though the executive branch thought it did exist in law, um, was put there for a purpose. It's not government ineptitude, right? It's not stupidity. It was put there for a purpose to protect people's rights. Roundly criticized by the 9 11 Commission. Mm -hmm. I think it's inevi absolutely inevitable the WikiLeaks uh, issue turned out like it did. There's no incentive in the government to withhold information from other agencies, right? There is from disseminating. Um, outside, but the pressure is share that information with other agencies. There are procedures that stop us from doing that, but the pressure is always there. So I, I, I'm not at all surprised that WikiLeaks turned out like it did. As to the fact of the flight, I mean, I, I think that's, um, do you own that information? I'm not so sure you do. So, so there can be all kinds of reactions to the fact that somebody's going to tell somebody that I flew. Do I own the fact that I flew? That's something for our, our national conversation, I think, about what we think is worthy of protection and what we think is not. And in order to be able to have that national conversation, we have to have government transparency about what is going on. So let me just say for the record, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm not aware of any fusion centers here that collect up all that kind of information on US citizens. Maybe they do, but I'm not aware of uh, that. Was, we're, we have that information from, I believe, a FOIA request that we made where it was a list of, of all of the places that were supposed to flow information to these fusion centers. They might not have actually reached that goal yet, uh, but that is what the proposal is, what's what the goal is. Well, speaking of expectation of privacy, I'd like to ask the panel, and this is kind of high visibility in Duke Law School because it was subject of the moot court appellate briefs. On the, uh, on the cases, which there are cases going both ways, in terms of attaching the GPS to your vehicle surreptitiously without a warrant and tracking your movements uh, because there's no expectation of privacy on if, like one of the cases talks about if you don't have a fence on your private property that means you're inviting anybody to walk on onto your uh, driveway and put something on your car so there's no no in, uh, Fourth Amendment infirmity there, and then as you go on a public highway, anybody can see you. So the fact that the government's using a GPS to track your moves, no reasonable expectation of privacy. Any, any view on that? Um, 
on the first part in particular, and this was actually, uh, this idea was roundly criticized by the dissent, uh, I think it was in the Ninth Circuit, this idea that there's a real class distinction there, that if you're a person who lives in a gated community or has a garage in which you keep your car, you have an expectation of privacy then. If you are a person who parks your car on a public street, you don't have an expectation of privacy. Uh, the government can attach that GPS to your car. And this, actually, there's been quite a circuit split in this, and, and it is going to go up to the Supreme Court. Obviously, our stance at, at Epic, and we wrote an amicus on this in the Connolly case, is that uh, you do have an expectation of privacy. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a difference, once again, between someone being able to see you driving down the street and someone tracking every single move that you make throughout your day. Let's open up. Yes, ma'am. Once your privacy has been breached, are there any avenues that you can reconcile the information that's out there on you? Because sometimes people just put information out, don't know the ramification of that information being out there. Are there any avenues to try to bring the voice back into the bond? <laughs> It depends on who's doing it. I mean, as, as you well know, if, you, if you're if you signed up to a magazine, your name's on a list, and sometimes those lists are sold to other private entities that say, oh, I've got this person. Then you get all sorts of junk mail, and particularly when you get in the 70s and 80s, you ought to see the junk mail that the old folks get. I mean, they just get a lot because they figure, well, they'll sign a check on anything. My mom and dad are in their 80s, and it's a, it's a phenomenal amount of mail that they've all of a sudden received in the last 10 years from different companies that they have no idea where they're coming from. So I, I guess the, the answer is it depends on, on who is doing it and for what purpose. And uh, uh, obviously, if it's in the commercial realm, you you're pretty much uh, you know you're pretty much out there. Yeah. Uh, my wife, for example, I've got if you've got a lot of the cell phones now, she can track me. I can't say, hey, honey, I was on this side of town. She said, no, you weren't. I I know where you were at 202, and that's not where you said you were. So, you know, that's, and a lot of people don't realize that those capabilities are out there. So um, you really have to be very active in securing your own information. Um, and I tell this to my students all the time. When you do an email, assume your worst enemy is reading that email. When you get on Facebook or you post something on there, assume that your employer in three years is going to see all those things on your tongue and the red hair or whatever else you're putting on, on the Facebook thing there. I mean, you've got to be very careful. You've got to be active in protecting um, your private information. I think the burden is, is you know, with, this, with, with, with the technology expansion, um, uh, anonymity, as, as one of the previous speakers says, is, is going to become a myth one of these days, at least in the public sector, in the private context. And it, um, Anybody who's hit reply all knows the feeling of your worst enemy seeing your, your yep. email when you meant to hit. Yeah, you're but I think, I think you're raising a very good, good point. One of the problems today is that it is almost impossible to get information off of the web, in part because there aren't many legal options. You can't, it's very hard to sit, the ISPs by and large, correct me if I'm wrong, are pretty much immune from, from suit. I think that if we are going to recapture our, well, let me throw this out to the panel and to our other colleagues here. And this is something that Jeff suggested. Is there a future for recapturing privacy by allowing more private rights of action when, you know, do you have a right to your information and can you require somebody to take it off and take it off the web and if not, should you have a right of action? What, what do you all think? It creates interesting First Amendment questions as well. Um, because sometimes the people, point. if someone is writing about you or writing about something in which you were involved, uh, I mean, they do have the First Amendment right to do that if it, as long as it doesn't fall under some sort of statute for defamation. There's been an, there's actually an interesting book called uh, Delete. I forget who the author is. But there's uh, an idea proposed in there that, that we look to a more technological solution for this, that uh, pieces of information that are put up on the internet, so perhaps photographs and those sorts of things, have uh, built within them uh, some sort of coding that then allows that to expire at a certain point, um, which is an interesting proposal. It, again, might have um, some impact on, on First Amendment and the availability of information online. Fascinating. Very good. There's another issue out there too that I've been exposed to is uh, 
in, in Texas, I've had a couple of doctors come up to me where they had an employee that had um, you know, taken information without their permission and, and transferred it to somebody else, and they tried to get the state to prosecute, and the prosecutors like, wow, you know, and they just, they have no interest in doing that because it's too complex. The learning curve between the folks in the, uh, you know, that, that have the job to enforce the law, it, this is very difficult stuff. You've got to be schooled on this. You've got to get the expert witnesses in. It's not like someone, you know, robbing a 7-Eleven. You've got a couple of, you know, cameras, and it's a pretty easy case to do. These are hard cases to prove. And I think through our legal system, in all these contexts, uh, things evolve very slowly. And so we're, we're, we're going through a lot of growing pains. But I would, as a general principle, I would like to err on the side of, of preserving as much civil liberties as possible. Because once you give up a civil liberty, it's hard to get it back. I mean, it's real easy to give it up, hard to get it back. So I'm very much opposed to law enforcement being able to put a GPS device on a car wherever it's parked. Uh, you know, without a warrant. Without a warrant. Uh, that's, that's very troubling because that's, that's a Pandora's box because where is it going to end? And what's the next step? If that's enshrined in law, uh, that is truly the slippery slope, which is a warrant argument because there's always notches on the slope. But, uh, but that's troubling. Patrick, can I ask you, you one purpose, or one question along that line that occurred to me? Has there been a difference, do you think, uh, with the change in the law that just makes uh, a foreign surveillance purpose, a purpose versus the purpose. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know, yeah. Um, has there been a difference in effect? Right. Well, it does, I mean, the, the, the demolition of the wall, along with that change language, does provide opportunities for prosecutors to use information that was gathered for foreign intelligence purposes, but they never had this opportunity before. I haven't really studied, maybe you have, I haven't studied the issue as to how often that actually happens, but. But, but the reality is prosecutors can and sometimes do get much more involved in the foreign intelligence collection side of things, whereas they were, the, 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 the ruling that was appealed in the first appeal ever required a government escort to go along with the prosecutors to make sure that they didn't um, be exposed to the wrong thing. That doesn't exist anymore. Do you think that there would be any utility to having the law such that there's only X kinds of offenses that can be used, that can be prosecuted based on information gained under one of, one of these national security authorities, where it's just a purpose. In other words, you could use a, a purpose being national security, gather the information. If it turned out not to be that you didn't have a national security related offense, then you, you could not use it for the more pedestrian or non-national security. I think it may be that way already. Um, so Title 18 does limit the, the offenses for which you can do electronic surveillance and for which you can introduce evidence. So I, I'm not an expert in law enforcement at all by any means, but I think you might have already described the way things are. Homer is a plant here, you might know. Yeah, Homer. Um, I think the classic answer to that is the ESA case, which was uh, uh, electronic surveillance of a PLO uh, affiliated uh, immigrant in St. Louis who had a disagreement with his daughter over her Americanization. And we had a microphone in the, in the house uh, surveilling his activities on behalf of the PLO. And one, one night the, um, the disagreement of opinion over her Americanization reached the point that the parents beat the daughter to death and the determinative information and the ability of the St. Louis authorities and the Missouri authorities to prosecute them was what we had received on, on uh, recordings. Now the bad news is it wasn't monitored until the following week, so we couldn't prevent it. But I think in a case like that, if I can draw an analogy to something like the Plain View Doctrine, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's best to leave those to the judges in individual cases based upon the facts, rather than trying to create a prophylactic bright line, bright line rule. Very good. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we might have time for maybe one more question. George? Or let's, let's go with the young man up. And then we'll do George and, and we'll be good. Going back to uh, Jeff's initial comments uh, on cybersecurity, you were saying it was going to take like a, a massive lawsuit or a disaster to, to influence us to increase it. Is the uh, success of programs like Stuxnet, has that not initiated the, that trend toward increasing it? 
Well, the, the private industry loses a lot of money each year. Imagine you're sitting on the board of directors at a company and somebody comes in and says, hey, we just had a cybersecurity breach. We lost X amount of millions of dollars. Do you want to tell anybody? Because suppose you run a bank and uh, you announce that to the people, it comes out in the newspapers. Well, the next day everybody takes their money out of your bank and goes to another bank. So many companies will absorb the losses. They'll absorb the hits um, because they, it's bad for business and the board of directors do not like that. That's part of the tension that we have is that is even though there are statutes that says, yeah, you know, under FOIA, we're going to protect your information if you share it with the government. Um, it, it's just there's been a huge reluctance in, the, in private industry to really upgrade their cybersecurity standards. Every year at our center, we do at least one cyber conference, and, and we try to educate businesses about what's happening and, and what you need to do, and, and as I briefly diagrammed here today. Um, but like Connie Francis, I mean, the hotel industry, you know, they knew before that occurred that they had problems with security. There had to be some security managers. The 9-11 Commission report, you know, people went to American Airlines and said, hey, <laughs> these doors don't lock. I mean, people are imaginative and, and they know that it's coming, but they simply are not doing anything. So I think the motivation <coughs> and, and the growth of premises liability really started with this case back in the 60s. And we're going to see something that's just... You know, I just I think it's just a matter of time, which will, and I think that's the way that we're going to get improvement in in the cybersecurity system. I don't think it's going to be through statutes or regulatory uh, methodologies. I think it's going to be between you know premises liability tort law. This no. is where uh, breach notification laws come into play too. Uh, a law that would require that if there was some sort of data breach, then that yeah, the, the holder it. of the notification. Uh, oh, yeah. That. But Stuxnet and that kind of capability, I think, is one reason why you saw this memorandum of agreement very unprecedented between NSA and Homeland Security to bring NSA's capabilities into cybersecurity. It's not, they're not bringing surveillance cap capabilities, but they're bringing cyber defense type capabilities because of that and the very sophistication of that particular uh, challenge. George, you're, you're going to have the last word here. Just a quick point. that I think this problem is much larger than just national borders. I think you've got a transnational problem, and it cuts two ways. First is how uh, Internet packets travel. And, you know, you might have everything in the world going on in this country that's right, but then they travel somewhere else. And the second is the originator. And might you want to comment on that? Well, I think attribution is always a challenge, and I think one of the earlier panels made a very, very good point. Uh, and, I, and our panelists will have a chance to comment, but there, every country in the world thinks that they have the capability of building their national defense, and all they have to do is buy one computer and, and they, can, they can have that capability. And I think that's been an impediment in getting the kinds of international agreements that might facilitate attribution and international investigations. There have been some uh, agreements, but I don't know that there's, I agree with Suzanne or whoever made the comment in the earlier panel. Any of our panels, one last comment before we... Uh, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, global implications. Uh, it's, 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 and that's one of the reasons that we are very cautious about using cyber when we uh, use force because we might take out a target and shut out the lights in you know half of, of, of France. Uh, everything's interconnected, um, so I think your point's well taken. I'm, I'm simply my position was you know looking at our own critical infrastructure that we have here to support our lifestyles and what we, we you know we need to secure that. It it, it is not secured. Uh, there are ramifications. There are global ramifications, um, and uh, we are the hub. I mean, the United States is the hub for the world. I mean, as far as, far as cyber connectivity. Any last comments, Patrick, Ginger? Well, I'd like to thank our panel very much for giving us really, gosh, what, a, what an opportunity to, to hear from real experts and covering such a wide range of topics. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. Uh,